All right, good morning, everyone. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, the announcements I was going to make. Announcement. We, let's just take a look at this. Uh, mm, our course plan here. All right, da, 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 da. that's not the one, is it? No, that's not the one. This is the one that I want, the course plan. All right, so let's look at this thing here. This is week six, October 14, sorry, October, no. It's week seven right now, sorry. October um, 17 to 21st. Uh, and it says test, all right? So we're going to have the test. I'm going to release this test uh, today uh, towards the afternoon. And we are going to have until Thursday night to complete that because Friday, I gotta give you some of the midterm feedback, all right? So this test is going to be available later on today afternoon until the one minute before midnight uh, on Thursday night. It's not going to be till Friday. It's going to be till Thursday because Friday I have to give you the midterm feedback. Okay. So please, if somebody is not uh, participating in this live class, uh, please let them know. And if you're participating in that, please pay attention to what has just been said. Okay. And yeah, that's all I got to say about that. I'm also going to um, make an uh, put it in the announcement section, this information. And I'm also going to um, send email to everyone just so there is no misunderstandings. Okay. okay. <clears throat> So that's enough said about that. And uh, this test is going to be all the stuff that was on the quiz. So you already have a head start of uh, studying the information plus uh, whatever was um, after that, which is we're, go we're going to add that boxes and devices. Right. So this is the second part of the boxes and devices. All right, let's get to it. So boxes and devices, second part. This is going to be shorter lesson um, than all the others, but I always say that. Okay, so let's uh, let's see what we have here. Now, uh, this is the continuing from uh, from the last class. So over here we have an example of a single gang plastic box. What can we say about this? Remember the dimensions of the single gang box that over here, this is two inches and over here, so that will be the, the short side, excuse me, and the long side will be three inches. What makes it a single gang box is that there's two inches here. Right, this thing is laying on its side, but if you uh, put it up the right side up, uh, you're going to have two inches across. And if you want to get another, if you want to make a double gang uh, box, it would be four inches and so on. Now, this is not a gangable box. It is a just as it is on its own. Now, uh, the one thing I want to bring attention to is there's that grounding strip right here or bonding strip. Because it's a plastic box, um, obviously plastic is a dielectric, which means it doesn't conduct electricity. Mm -hmm. And devices such as switches, for example, some of the switches don't have the bonding terminal. Like for example, when we have the um, duplex receptacle that we are uh, are using during our labs, uh, that uh, receptacle does have a separate screw terminal for the bonding connection. Some of the switches 
as you'll be able to see later on, they don't have the bonding screw terminal. Where the bonding happens is through the chassis of the switch that is being mounted onto the box and the box is uh, bonded or grounded. So the box is still bonded or grounded, but you can't bond or ground plastic because it just doesn't conduct electricity. So this one has a separate grounding strip or bonding strip. I, I keep using the bonding and grounding interchangeably because I want that to get into your head that bonding is grounding and grounding is bonding, but there's a difference between bonding and grounding and it's just a physical connection. Just in short, grounding, is some, some, we can tell that something is grounded if there is a straight uninterrupted run to a, something that's called a true ground. And bonding is also, uh, the terminal is also, uh, a bonded terminal is also grounded, but it is not with a straight uninterrupted run. It will go through some other device box and the connection will be made there. And then from there, it will be continuing to the ground, to the true ground. So then that device is bonded, All right? So, uh, so we need to have uh, some sort of a bonding connection for the switch because the switch is through the chassis and that chassis is going to touch this and it's going to be mounted onto this bonding strip and thus the, 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 the device such as a switch that doesn't have a separate screw terminal for bonding will be bonded. And the, the bonding terminal or the bonding conductor will be connected to the bonding terminal uh, right here. Okay. Next. Well, here's an example of a um, four um, four by the 11 16 uh, 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 square um, square box okay remember the second second dimension tells you the depth of the of the of the box and four inches so you can say you can see already that four it's a square box four inches by four inches by four inches by four inches got it uh, so you we only specify one side okay <clears throat> Not much to say about this one because already we already covered that. Uh, what was this thing being used for? Well, um, mostly as junction boxes and sometimes uh, for mounting uh, higher power uh, devices. All right, stove and dryer receptacles. All right, so here is the footprint. And here is a footprint. And this is a footprint of a 50 amp range receptacle. What is a range? Range is a basically electric stove. That's a range, electric range, another name for it. And that requires 50 amps service. And this is the footprint of the receptacle that, uh, that we would have to install. And here's another footprint of a 30 amp dryer receptacle. That would be used for a dryer, electric dryer. Uh, now, octagon device box, four inches by one and a half, and four inches by two and uh, one eight. That is, yeah. So four inches, uh, four, uh, and this is the. This time, I can't draw it here. So here, this would be this dimension, four inches from side to side. And this would be the octagon because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, 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 this would be the, uh, uh, well, eight, it has eight corners. So you know what? Octagon stands for eight. That's a device box. All right, so uh, this would fit uh, how many? 10 of 14 gauge conductors. So if you had 14 gauge conductors, it would, it, it would be legal to install up to 10 of them. And from the previous lecture, we know how to count the conductors, what counts as a conductor and what doesn't. And uh, if you go a little bit deeper with that, 
four inches by two and one eight, of course, it's going to fit more of the 14 gauge conductors, for example. Right? Now, fixtures, stud, fixture, stud, and hickey. Right? Let's read what it says here. Ceiling fixtures often have what is called a hickey that attaches to the stud mounted in the ceiling box. Hmm. That attaches to the stud mounted in the ceiling box for hanging fixtures. Okay, there we go. Ceiling fixtures often have what is called a hickey and this is a hickey right here. That's what it's called. And the hickey attaches to the stud so it's not just hanging in the drywall ceiling um, because there is something, it has to support something heavier. Like for example, a ceiling fan. You will never mount a ceiling fan just on the drywall. That thing is going to fall through. Right? Uh, so we need to mount that fixture onto something that's more sturdy than, uh, than, uh, than just a drywall. It has to be mounted to the stud, which is the, well, framing of the uh, well, house, for example. Right? This allows the weight of the fixture to be supported by the box. So the box is mounted to the stud, then the hickey is mounted to the box, which is mounted to the stud. So we have, uh, uh, we have pretty good weight support system. And then the rest of the light fixture continues. Uh, what do we have here? Octagon, octagonal box wired for a lamp holder. We are going to wire one of those during the, our last lab. What can we see here? Here is a plastic fixture. What is this fixture? This fixture here, that's considered as a lamp holder. So if somebody is mentioning lamp holder, then that's what they mean. A fixture that basically holds a light bulb. And what do we have here? The bonding wire goes right to the bonding terminal of the metal box. And that's where the bonding stops because we can't bond ground, uh, or ground the pla uh, dielectric plastic, doesn't conduct. Right? And it, does, it only has two terminals, one hot and one neutral. Where does the hot goes? hot goes to the middle of the, if you flip it inside, well, if you look at from this side here, you're going to have that middle prong and then you're going to have the thread. So the neutral goes to the thread and the hot goes to that one kind of a dot in the middle. Like for example here, a lamp holder. This is a lamp holder, right? You can have, you can see, that there are two screw terminals and just like with the duplex or septical, one of them seems to have those um, silverish type of a um, colored screw terminal and the other one is brass color. So of course, uh, brass is darker than the silverish white, then black is darker than white. So you can kind of match those kind of similarities in color. Uh, and that's how you can go by. But if for some reason those are missing, the, the, they are the same color, you can just, uh, you can eyeball it or you can use your continuity meter on your, on your multimeter to, uh, to, to, to find out which screw terminal is assigned to which connection in the lamp holder. So here is the middle part of the lamp holder. That's where the black goes. That's where the hot wire goes. That's where the, all the energy is. And uh, well, white also has the energy, but it has a return energy coming. Uh, so uh, the electricity comes from the hot, which is black, continues through the load and is being returned to the electrical panel through the white conductor, which is always neutral. And the hot could be black or for example, red or some other color, but it should never be white. There you go. So that's an example of 
a lamp holder. Now, one um, piece of advice, if I may give you right now, and I will be repeating that. See those, these are the mounting screw terminals right here, mounting screw holes. Whenever you're going to mount it onto the octagonal box, which is this here, and that thing goes right here and right here. These are the two screws. When you are going to fasten those fasteners or screws, please do not overkill it. Do it with a feel because this is plastic. If you crank it too much, you're just going to basically crack up and the, or crack damage the, um, this part right here. Wire connections to common devices, duplicator septical. Uh, we already gone through it, but we're just going to analyze it uh, as such right now. Black or red conductors go to the brass screw. So pretty much we are all on the same, uh, on the same page with that one. White conductor goes to the silver screw, which is the neutral. So black is hot and white is neutral. Okay. Uh, uninsulated bare conductor to the box connection and green screw. Basically the uninsulated bare copper conductor, which is the bonding conductor, uh, <coughs> excuse me, goes to the box connection of the bonding terminal. And we already have gone through that. Uh, when it comes to the colors of the conductors for the bonding or grounding, it says uninsulated, so bare copper wire or bare wire. There's also another one, if it's jacketed, it has to be green green jacketed so they'll be grounding or bonded uh well, we have gone through already a couple of slides back uh would be the lamp holder black or red conductor goes to the brass screw white conductor to silver screw and the bonding wire here goes to the box connection only why because the chassis of this lamp holder is made out of plastic and plastic does not conduct electricity all right, wire connections to the common devices, single pole switch. You know what, we're gonna skip this slide, we're gonna come back to it, so it makes more sense to you. Let's take a look at the switches. Now, single pole switch, here is the bonding terminal. So this one does have the bonding terminal, but mostly when you're going to buy it, this will be missing. So, Remember, how is this? Because this is all metal here. So this has to be bonded, has to be grounded. How do we ground that? You see, here's that screw terminal right here. Uh, no, here, right here. There's a screw terminal right here. And another screw terminal is right here. So that screw terminal, when it goes, let's just go to the first slide here that we had. Those go right here and look at this right here. So when that metal chassis is fastened to this bonding terminal, then it makes, it makes the whole switch bonded or grounded. So sometimes you're going to see the switches uh, being available with the bonding terminal and you can use the bonding terminal or sometimes you're going to see switches without this bonding terminal. Uh, and this is, uh, remember, uh, just by touching that and fastening this whole chassis with that screw, uh, fastening screw to the uh, bonding terminal, that's how things are grounded. Right. Now, single pole switch let me just quickly fire up my photoshop just so i could draw some lines now single pole switch you can also call it a two-way switch but you're not going to do that uh, single pole switch is basically a interruptor if you can say that. Um, I'm just firing up my, uh, yeah, this should do. Uh, 
All right. Can I bring it to the sharing? There we go. So I just get some colors here. Uh, this should be fine. And let's get a pencil. Yeah, let's make it thicker. Yeah, we got a good line here. All right, so if you have the terminals of the single pole switch, these will be the terminals and there will be conductor continuing one way, conductor continuing the other way. Here's the pole and it's a single pole. And how do we uh, connect the, how do we complete the circuit as well? There could be uh, some sort of a power source. There could be some sort of a load. Okay. And that would be the simplest way of doing it. So you open or close in order to continue. Now, whether this thing is uh, uh, considered uh, proper or not, it interrupts the circuit. Of course, the hot terminal has to be switched, not the, um, it actually is. No, it's not, right? But you get the idea of a single pole switch. Here's a terminal, here's a terminal, and you either open this or you close this. Right? Single pole, single pole, single throw, single pole, single throw switch because you can only throw it one way. Let me erase this. All right, now, if we want to do something like this, single pole, double throw switch. So here is a terminal. Here is a switch terminal. And here is a common terminal. Here will be conductor going and here will be a conductor going and here will be a conductor going. So in the single pole, double throw. single pole double throw you have a single pole here and you can throw it into two ways you can either connect it to this terminal here or you can connect it to this terminal here now when we're going to connect something like a three-way switch and it is also in our electrical term terminology this one is considered a three-way switch how many, uh, and how you can tell it's a three-way switch. Well, how many ways to get into that switch with conductors? Here's one, here's two, here's three, however way you wanna count it. So it's a three-way switch. And in the, our terminology that we're going to use, we're going to call this a common, We're going to call these two traveler, just like a traveler, a person who travels, traveling luggage or something. So here's a common terminal, and here's a traveler, and here's a traveler. Right. All right, so here's a three way switch. Just skip the bonding terminal because sometimes it just doesn't even exist. How many ways to get into that switch? Well, one, two, three ways to get into that switch. Just like this way here. Here's the common, here's the traveler, here's the traveler, and it's considered to be a single pole double throw switch. I'm going to skip the diagram of how this four-way switch is connected. We're going to go over a little bit later. 
because it's not just as simple as a double pole double throw. It's like a crisscross connection. But I want you to get first, I want you to get the idea of a single pole switch. And I want you to get the idea of a three way switch, which here is the common. Uh, sorry, here will be the common. And here will be the two travelers. Which would be again, just like the diagram right here, one common and two travelers. Now, if you had a ohm meter, just a continuity meter or multimeter that you have set to a continuity tester, an idea of how you would um, check it if those, let's say those things are not labeled. You have the three terminals, one and two, and three terminals. Based on this idea that, that I drew here, how would you can how would you test that with the continuity meter to determine which is the common? And obviously the other ones will be the travelers. Can I give you a bit, uh, maybe a few seconds to think about it? Or maybe somebody can answer right away. And you would have a switch like this with these things not labeled. All right, I guess we're not having any volunteers today. That's okay. Just look at how these connections are being made. This common here, terminal, is either going to connect to this terminal traveler or the other traveler. That's the only two options that this common has. So if you flip the switch one way, you're going to have a continuity between the common and one of the travelers. If you flip the switch the other way, you're going to have a continuity with the common and the other traveler. So one way is to find out because the common either connects here and here or connects here and to the other traveler. These two travelers, these two travelers will never ever make contact with each other. There will never be a continuity between these two. So you connect the multimeter on the continuity test, which is the one that when you have the continuity between two points, which is basically zero ohms, <coughs> excuse me, is going, you're going to have that continuity sound, like a long annoying beep. And if you find that you only have two terminal, three terminals, so you can connect this thing to a couple of them and flip the switch back and forth. If you get the continuity or not, beep or not, that means you haven't found the two travelers. But if you connect your multimeter across the two travelers, no matter how you flip the switch, it will never make contact, those, those two will never make contact. So you have found the two travelers, which means the third one is the common. So then you can connect one lead to the common and connect one lead to one of the travelers and find out which position of the switch connects to that terminal. And then you switch um, uh, from, for, for, from this one, for example, the other lead to this one, and then flip the switch and see if it makes contact after you flip the switch. Okay, so first I would find where is it, which two terminals make no contact, and these will be the two travelers, no matter how you flip the switch. And then I would just kind of confirm which position of the switch connects the common to which traveler. 
So this is how a three-way switch looks like. A three-way switch is a common device, common device used, like for example, in the stairwell, it's something called the stairway switch. You have a basement, in the house and there are stairs that are connecting you to the second floor of the of the house okay let me just get rid of that so these are the stairs very bad stairs don't walk on these okay and this there would be a let's say there would be a light bulb here right. light switch emitting light okay and or sorry there'll be light and this would be a switch and upstairs would be another switch so if you are walking upstairs on these badly made stairs you know and you forgot to turn the light off and when you go to the top you don't have to go all the way downstairs you can flip this switch to turn the light off or you can go walk out and flip this in either way either switch is going to control the light it's a common situation here so that's the idea of a three-way switch what makes it a three-way switch because we have three ways of getting into the switch i'm grinding this idea left and right front and center just so you get the concept if you haven't yet okay so it's a three-way switch is being used to install a system that's called a three-way switch system which would be common use of that would be the stairwell case Can have two switches and they're there are three way again because there are three ways to get at the switch and this is going to be our last lab this is going to be part of your assignment as well to draw different situations and different connections different wave of arranging wires because and i'm giving you a head start you can have the power supplied to the light bulb location to the load location or you can have the power supplied to one of the switch switches or you can have the power supplied to another switch so you can have the power supplied here you can have the power supplied here or you can have the power supplied here and depending on where the power is supplied you're going to run the wires certain way in order to make this whole system work so your assignment is going to be according to those instructions that i will provide you uh, that uh, you're going to have to draw out um, those three different situations and here is a four-way switch Whereas four-way switch, and you're going to basically deal with uh, that the, in the next uh, the next term. A four-way switch you will have to use if, like for example, let's say you have another stairwell case. Right? That's a hypothetical situation. And if you still forgot to turn the light off, you could have another switch here that you can use that either of those three switches you can uh, you can use to control this light bulb no matter where what the condition is you can turn it on or off from any of those switches so this uh, for this one here you're going to have to add something that's called a four-way switch and i just don't want to get into it yet because uh it's a little bit different than just a uh, double pull double throw it is sort of double pull, double throw, but it's arranged a little bit different. And if you want, you can research that on your own, but you'll you'll be given that thing in a greater detail. For now, remember what the single pulse switch is, 
remember what the three-way switch is and i just want you to know that the four-way switch exists for now uh how can you tell it's a four-way switch well skip the grounding terminal how many ways can you get at that switch you can get it from one two three or four ways here so that's how we can tell all right here is um well three-way switches connecting three-way switches how can you tell that this is a three uh, three way switch system? Well, you have two three way switches one, two, three here. That's you can get uh, the switch from three terminals. Here's another one. And you can, uh, I'm just going to leave this with you, just uh, try to analyze the situation. Where is the power being provided? The power is being provided to the lamp location in this scenario. And this is not going to be on a test, not this one, but I just want you to start analyzing that. How is it that uh, this thing is made to work? Uh, one thing that is not correct as far as the new electrical code that we have right now is that the neutral wire is supposed to continue all the way through the whole system, whether it's being used or not. What is wrong with this picture here? This is just, you can treat it as a functional diagram, but you can see the neutral wire, which is the white wire here, and it goes only to the light bulb. And what do we have here is that you have that white wire marked with the tape that when you see that, that means somebody who has installed that some time ago, they have marked the wire with the electrical tape that because you only have so many wires, so many conductors in the cable and the white is being used as neutral, but when somebody tapes, when you see that, that means somebody from the previous years who installed that, they marked the white conductor to let you know that even though it is white, but it's not being used as neutral. So it's not because somebody had some tape wrapped around it and they forgot to remove it. No, it's because they marked it to be not neutral. <coughs> okay. So over here, what we have, what's wrong with this one? It's not up to code right now, but you will see some of the older installations is that the neutral has to continue. So normally right now, if you would do a new installation, you would run another wire through this conduit. That would be the neutral and it would connect. It would make another pigtail where it would connect with this neutral and it would continue to this box. If this box does not need to utilize the neutral, you still have to run that neutral into that box. And then you will make another pigtail and you would continue to another box. And if there is no need for that neutral to be used in this particular switch, you would just tap it off with a wire connector. So just to make sure that uh, it's not touching anything by accident. There is a reason why that change has been made. And that's all I'm going to have to say about that. <laughs> right? Three-way switch lamp. Um, here's another scenario on that. So if you can, just analyze these connections here and compare that to the way I drew the switch for you. which would be the three-way switch. Here's a common, here's a traveler, here's a traveler, so it's labeled common, traveler, and a traveler. And here is the switching pole. So it can either go here 
or it can move here. And here's a conductor, here's a conductor, here's a conductor. So if you look at this type of thing, so these are the common and the travelers. Here is a common and the travelers. Here's a common, you can probably tell. And here are the two travelers. And so is this here. Here's the common. And here are the two travel. Uh, this thing is just two travelers. I wish I could turn those options off. And these are the wires. So just go uh, uh, in your spare time. Just um, this will be better just analyze the pathway for the current to flow what are you looking for you're looking for closed circuit when do we have a closed circuit well we have a closed circuit when we have a closed circuit so this would be a idea of a closed circuit so here will be a power supply here will be a conductor here will be a load and the circuit will be closed back to the power supply. So the current flows through the load and goes back. You can add a switch to it to, oh, come on. I guess I can't draw anymore. Oh yeah, I know why. You can add a switch. You can add a switch, <laughs> right? So you can turn it on and off. So there will be a single pole switch. That's what you're looking for. Well, how would we make it a two-way switch? Well, if we added another one, terminal here, and if this would be common, this would be two travelers. You can flip the switch either to here or you can flip the switch to here. And there will be another load going back to the power supply. So you can either make the current flow through this load or you can make the current flow through this load by using the three-way switch. There's a three-way switch. So that's what you're looking for. Is your head smoking yet? All right. All right. Handy box, also known as utility box. This is the box that we're playing with uh, during our labs. Well, what can you tell this with about this one here? Well, it's a single gang box. You can tell that already. And it's a metal box, and it does have a grounding terminal. That's it, and it has knockouts to insert the connectors. The, one of the connectors that we have used was a two screw connector. And if the knockouts are not being used and they are being removed, you're going to have to blind them with the blank, uh, basically blank face, blank plates. There are different types of connectors, L16, L17, 4040, we'll go over that later on. Uh, also, you can have those connectors because uh, there will be a set screw here in this connector here, for example. You insert the, the cable and you use the set screw to push down. See, here's that little uh, pusher thingy, right? And that would press against the connect, uh, conductor or the wire or the cable, sorry, the cable to, to hold that in. Or you can have those plastic connectors as well. And you insert this part, 
you can squeeze it with your two fingers, you insert that into the knockout, and you release. And that thing is being held by that. And there is a, like a one-way valve here. You can push the cable from that side, and you can keep pushing it. But because it's angled a certain way, this little stopper, uh, you can't pull it out. Oh, well, you can if you really try to. But uh, uh, but it's being held strong enough, and these are much quicker to install. And it's, they're also legit. You can use those. And here's an example of that being used right here. Not a very clear picture, but there are also box connectors for EMT, and we're going to talk about EMT as well later on. We're going to study that. So these will be the box connectors for electrical metallic tubing which are the pipe what are the pipes and you can see there's an example of a well half inch pipe being fastened to the box using an emt connector you put you put that into the box here's a set here's a lock nut so you use that just as we used before in the, with the two screw connector. And you insert the pipe into the other side of the connector and you tighten it with the set screw. Sometimes you might want to extend the metallic tubing because, um, well, quite often they come with the 10 foot lengths and sometimes you're going to have to run a raceway or a wire way that is longer than 10 feet from one point to another. So you're going to have to couple two of those or sometimes three. So that's why we would use couplers. You insert a pipe from this end and you insert another pipe from this end and you have an extended pipe. And here's a set screw that is going to fasten that pipe so it holds. And here's another set screw that's missing here that is going to fasten another pipe. Now, those set screws are meant to just hold that in place so it doesn't wiggle. It is not meant to hold it sturdy so you can't have uh, here. Sometimes what people do, and those electrical metallic tubing pipes are not always used for electrical connections. Sometimes you're going to use it for data. So let's say there's a ceiling. There's a ceiling here. And there is an electrical metallic tubing fastened to the ceiling somehow, ceiling structure, whichever way it is fastened. And you need to, like, this is 10 feet, but you need to have this thing lower than 10 feet. So maybe 12 feet or 13 feet. So you would cut another pipe to accommodate that because let's say, for example, you're going to have a box here and to this box, you're going to have a uh, security camera mounted. Right. So you would use that coupler to join these two. However, we're not supposed to just use those couplers because these couplers are not meant to hold the weight of things. So if you ever have that situation, and trust me, at some point, almost guarantee you're going to have to do installation like that. Use a safety measure so you can drill a hole through this metallic tubing. You can drill a hole through this metallic tubing, run a steel cable through it and fasten it here. So if something lets go, this thing doesn't come down because this is not meant to have that, uh, to hold weight. It's just meant to hold things in place. Or sometimes you can drill a screw through the coupler and the EMT and another drill screw through the coupler and EMT and it's going to have a, you know, so that's, uh, that's what I'm just trying to tell you 
this coupler is not meant to hold weight. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I have seen it in the field that people have actually done that. They thought that this here was meant to hold weight and it's not. Oops. There we go. All right, box offset. When you see the box, electrical box, the knockout are the knockouts are not flush with the bottom of the box. So if you mount that on the wall and you run and you run the electrical metallic tubing, tubing, which is basically going to be against the wall, and so is the bottom of the box, you're going to have to raise that, and you're not going to just force that little man and just stick it in. That is that looks so unprofessional. Don't do that. You're going to have to make a box offset, which is going to be the something that was going to be one of our labs. We're going to make two box offsets to connect two boxes from one side and the other side. So we're going to make a box offset that raises the pipe a little bit here in parallel way on one way and raises the pipe in the parallel way in the other way so the two boxes can be connected and the, con the conduit that goes between them can be put flush against the surface. Or sometimes you can use the box offset connectors that you don't have to do the box offset from the pipe so you can do one way or the other. When you're in the lab, this is a picture of our lab, actually. When you're in the lab next time, take a look around and look for the electrical metallic tubing and see how things are being done. When you walk around our school, look around. There are electrical metallic tubing devices or raceways run surface mount on top of the center blocks on top of the walls, start noticing them and think, how is it that whoever installed that, is it a box offset, is it a kick or is it a what? We're going to study the pipe bending. I'm going to introduce you to the pipe bending and you will continue that in the next term in greater detail. But I want you to start noticing that around the buildings, other buildings or in and around school. And when you're in the lab, look at those installations that is basically all around you right there. Okay. And this is five minutes to nine. So I'm going to let you go right now. And this is this is it. That's the last slide for this uh, for this thing. Remember about the test where I'm going to release that test online, same as the other one, but it's going to be worth more. However, you have three days to do it. You're going to have it full Tuesday, full Wednesday, and full Thursday to do it. Not going to have the whole week, <coughs> but you already had a head start of doing that because a lot of the questions are going to be the ones from the quiz number one. And still, it's better than having two hours, okay? So you're still ahead of the game when it comes to that. You just have to do it because I have to give you the midterm uh, mark. All right, that's it for today's class. Uh, have a great week and a great Monday. And remember, every day is almost Friday. So have a good one. <laughs> Bye.